can it be? My king would die for me. My king would die for me. And you did just that, Father. You died for us so that we can have that relationship with you, Father. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you so much for your amazing grace, Father. David Pastor, as he comes up and presents the word to us, Father, that we would understand the scriptures of him. Father, thank you for for this Wednesday night, Father. Bless us, guide us, Father. Father, we give this time to you. Yes. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Let's have you even another. Good evening, church. Good evening. Welcome tonight as we continue on our study through the book of Numbers. A couple of announcements before we we get started here. So this coming Saturday is our annual yard sale. It's one of our biggest events uh, here at the church. One of them. I said one of them. You know, make sure I don't offend some of you that have big events. <laughs> Aside from the baptism. Besides from the baptism, yeah, that's one of our great events. Yes. <laughs> so, bring all your treasures to the house starting tomorrow. But of course, tomorrow is raining, from what I hear and understand. Uh -huh. It's 40%, 50% chance, and then it's going to stop. So, you can bring tomorrow or Friday. Uh, Any time after, I think, uh, 3 o'clock or so, Virginia said, and they're going to be separating all the stuff, getting it ready, putting it on tables. And then Saturday morning, uh, if you'd like to get there early, those of you that signed up, me and Randy will be pulling everything out early in the morning, probably around 5 o'clock. At least I will. I'll be up. <clears throat> Randy will be up at 4. So he's going to go get us coffee and donuts. <laughs> so that event is coming up. Um, this Saturday, so prepare yourself, and those of you that are helping, we, we look forward to seeing you all there, and if you're not helping, just come on by, it's such a great event, there's so much going on, and especially in our little corner, we're going to have food, uh, menudo, pozole, we'll have burrito, soda drinks, donuts, just all kinds of stuff, and then of course, whatever's for sale there. Uh, is always interesting, so, so just come out and join us, and there's something, sometimes there's around around, um, oh, I don't know, several hundred homes that, that are selling stuff. So you can kind of find some treasures if you're a, a yard sale hunter. So, all right, if I can ask the guys to come forward. I believe that is it for our announcements. Tonight we will be in Numbers chapter three. So if you want to grab your Bibles and get ready for the word, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege of giving to you, Father. And this morning, Lord, as, as we were <clears throat> doing our Evo, we saw that the Apostle Paul very clearly uh, spoke about how we give <clears throat> from our hearts. And 
And if we give abundantly, God promises to bless us abundantly, Lord. If we give sparingly, then we will receive sparingly. And that's a principle that we find in the Bible, Lord. Uh, and it's a principle he uses uh, from nature itself. If you throw a few seeds, you're going to get a few items. If you throw many seeds, you'll get even more uh, harvest. And so, Lord, I pray that we would be generous givers like our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we worship you in our offerings, and we're going to worship you, Lord, as we read your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're in Numbers, the book of Numbers, and so far it's been pretty interesting as Moses has been counting the number of each tribe and preparing them for a battle. Raising an army. Raising an army. How important are armies? Very important. Especially for the protection of nations like ours. We have a great army. Russia has a great army. China has a great army. Israel has a great army. And these are nations that you don't see too many try to attack because of the greatness of their army. Their arsenal weapons are so good. It was true back then, it's true today. But ultimately, we must put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, right? Yeah. Amen. Pray that whether there's war or not war, our faith should always be in Jesus. So tonight's theme, as we continue on in Numbers chapter 3, is the Levites shall be mine. The Levites shall be mine. Now Jesus, God will say that several times uh, in this chapter pertaining to the Levites. Uh, in the word, in the words of King Solomon, and you probably have read that little book there, uh, the book of Solomon. In the king's words, this is what he said to his bride. I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. In Psalms, I'm sorry, in uh, the Song of Solomon in 63 I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. Those are beautiful words, aren't they? They portray the security of a husband and a wife who know they belong to one another, right? When you know that you belong to one another in your marriage, your marriage is secure. There's peace there. There's a rest there. And there's also a joy in a good marriage, this sense of belonging extends to the whole family, doesn't it? Because not only do you belong to one another, but your children also belong to you. And parents speak of their children with love and with great pride because they love their children. And the children speak affectionately of their mother and father or their brothers and their sisters because they know they all belong together. So this sense of belonging is available to all who acknowledge God as their Father. Mm. See, we all belong to the Lord. Amen. I find that most people are lonely. There's a loneliness in them. Even when they're married, they feel alone. If you're single, you probably feel even more alone. If you have no real friends, you probably feel alone. Now, there are times where you just cry out, to God, and you put your faith and trust in Him because He's the only one that you know cares and loves you more than anyone else. Now, many people don't recognize God as their maker or their owner, though. And they see themselves as orphans in a mindless universe, right? Accident of nature, evolution, who have no purpose, no meaning, and no hope. But we as believers in Christ Jesus can rejoice, as the psalmist would say, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. So we're his forever. We belong to him. And that's what he would say to us today is that you belong to me. Now that is so comforting to know that God loves us so much that he will never leave us or forsake us. He'll never let us go. He'll never let us go. He will not let us fall out of the palm of his hand. We are his forever. Forever. And we are his and he belongs to us also. And that's also an interesting thought to realize that 
He is my God, right? My God. And, and that's personal, right? And my boys all, oftentimes, they, they tell me, why do you call your mom my mother? Because they don't get that, that concept. They just say mom. When they're talking about their mom, they just say mom. And I, we always, as siblings, we always say my mother. And we would be talking to get with each other, and we'd say my mother. Because it's personal. You have an intimate relationship with them, and you sense that they're yours. They belong to you. And we all want that feeling of belonging. And how much more do we belong to the Lord himself? So in this chapter, the context we see Moses is asking uh, the Levites to prepare themselves for the move to Canaan. And Moses will count them as he did the other tribes, but also give them their duties since they will not be fighting like the other tribes, but they will be serving in the temple, maintaining the temple as the other tribes are out in battle. Three points tonight. Levites are special. Second point, the senses. And the third point, the Levites' dedication. So let's look at the Levites are special. Now, the Levites are special to the Lord. He set them apart from all the other tribes. Uh, the, these are the men like Moses and Aaron and Miriam, Korah, and we'll see the list of names there. That God said, I want you to be mine so that when you're in the temple of God, you're ministering to me. Is I desire you to minister to me in, in the preparation of the sacrifices and the offerings as Israel draws closer to me. That is your responsibility to maintain the temple because God wants us to minister to him. Now, that's kind of an interesting thought. Can we minister to God as though God needs us to minister to him? No, God doesn't need anything, but he desires that we minister to him. And in ministering to him, we end up ministering to ourselves. I have found something to be true. That we get into trouble when we stop going to church. When we stop reading the Bible. When we stop praying. We get into trouble. We find ourselves alone and lonely and without God and separated from the Lord. We find ourselves making decisions that end up having bad consequences. And then we ask ourselves, why is this happening? It seems like God's at a distance right now. Well, the reality is, is you're at a distance. You are not in church anymore. You are not fellowshipping anymore. You're not in your word. You're not praying to the Lord. There is a sense of God's presence when the body of Christ is gathered together. The Bible says that he encompasses the praises of his people. When his people gather together and they praise him, he's there. The Bible says that he, he bends his ear to hear them. Neat little picture. Mm -hmm. That's how much he wants to hear his people gathering together. This is how they know that you're my disciples, by the love you have one for another. How do you love your brother if you don't go to church? If you don't fellowship? You can't. So people will know that you're a disciple of Christ by the love you have for one another. And I find that when you gather at church, and you may know everything. I'm, I'm sure some of you people here know everything. Right? You guys all know. You're well taught. And, and you feel like, well, I don't really need to go to church. You know, what I, what I find interesting is on the holidays, like we just had Mother's Day. I find it interesting that people, I don't like Mother's Day, I'm not going. They make that decision, you know. Father's Day, oh, I don't like Father's Day, I'm not going to that. You know? and, and they make that decision. I remember one time uh, there was uh, a series going on on marriage. And I remember this brother came up to me and says, well, I won't be coming to church for the next three or four weeks. I'm like, why not? He goes, oh, because I'm never going to get married. I'm like, well, but what if you do? You don't know the future. It'd be nice to have this information, wouldn't it? Nah, I'm never going to get married. You know? Well, how about if you minister to someone? How about if you're ministering to somebody and, and you need some information, this is some good information that you can actually minister to the other person? Well, yeah, I never thought of it that way, you know? See, we don't think of it that way. We're so selfish. I'm not going to go. You know, as though God has done something to me because I haven't had any children. So why go to Mother's Day? Why go to Father's Day? You know, and God hasn't. Maybe God wants you to minister to those that don't have children. And you can minister to them. Or maybe he's going to put you in a place where you minister to a couple, to a mother. And yet, if you don't know anything about mothers, how are you going to minister to them? So you've got to stop thinking about yourself and think more about others more highly. So, 
Saying that now, we're going to see how special the Levites are to the Lord. Look at verse 1. Now, these are the records of Aaron and Moses when the Lord spoke with Moses on Mount Sinai. So they still haven't left. They're still at the bottom of the hill there in Mount Sinai. God is preparing them, and he's now focused on the Levites alone in this chapter. And I felt that it was important that we spend uh, the whole night in, in chapter 3, so we're going to go through this. And these are the names of the son of Aaron. Now, you know Aaron is the brother of Moses, right? Yeah. Uh, Aaron was used by God in a great way. And so Aaron becomes the priest. Well, there are still Levites within the family, but his family alone becomes the priest. That's how important they are. Now, Moses reminds us of Nadab, the firstborn, in Abihu, Eleazar, and Itamar. Now, Nadab and Abihu, who were the two oldest children of Aaron, and the two ranking priests behind him, yet they were struck down, you remember, in Leviticus chapter 10 by the Lord for offering profane fire before the Lord. And the Lord struck them down for their sin and not approaching the Lord properly and also flippantly, flippantly. Sometimes we need to be careful, youth. You know, I know we, we like to joke and have fun and, and I'm for that. But sometimes when we're going a little too far and it's the Lord's house, you know, you got to be careful because now you're bringing some strange fire. And to the Lord, and the Lord may strike you down. No, He won't strike you down. <laughs> he won't strike. He loves you so much, and we're under grace now. But you have to be careful how you approach the Lord. That's important to realize how important it is. We don't just. Yeah. I remember back in the days when rap was really big. Still is today, but when it was starting off and got pretty big, and then it kind of went into the church, and the church started rapping, and then they they had this type of rap where they were saying the man upstairs, you know. And doing that, and I'm just like, oh, God, it just didn't seem right to me to say the man upstairs. That's, he's not the man upstairs. He is Almighty God. Amen. He is Elohim. He's Yahweh. He's Jehovah. He's the I am, whatever you need him to be. There has to be a reverence for God himself. And we can't just flippantly come to him, you know. Otherwise, it's profane fire. Eleazar and Itamar inherited the priesthood now, Aaron's next two sons, and they pass it down to their sons after them. So this priesthood will stay within the family of Aaron. And verse 3 says, These are the names of the sons of Aaron, the anointed priests whom he consecrated to minister as priests. Now it's important to realize that the priests were only <coughs> one small family among the Levites. And God wanted it that way. It was just a specific family and his children that would be qualified to be priests within the temple. All the other Levites would not necessarily be priests, but they'd be servants in the temple. And God chose Aaron to be the high priest. And Nadab and Abihu had died before the Lord when they offered profane fire, verse 4, before the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai, and they had no children. So Eleazar and Itamar ministered as priests in the presence of Aaron, their father. So it passed down, and it will skip if someone happens to pass away. And this was done in, in the sight of Aaron. Aaron was the one making the decisions, and it was under his direction and his inspection. And as their father, servant, or minister of that office, it was his responsibility to oversee it. That was his place as the high priest. Now, there's a lot of similarities as we go through this chapter uh, 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 with church itself and how the government of church works. Uh, for instance, the pastor, you, you, would, you would probably say he's like the high priest where he oversees <coughs> the ministry. And you would all be the Levites that are serving within the temple. And you're there to serve him, Aaron, just like the Levites were to serve Aaron, the high priest, so that he can fulfill his role. It says in verse 5, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Bring the tribe of Levi near, and present them before Aaron the priest, that they may serve who? Serve him. Serve him. Why not serve the Lord? Now, that's a concept that we don't understand too often, and possibly because we don't read it too often. If you go to the, Old, to the New Testament, 
you'll find many times that Jesus makes reference to serving one another as brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. And when we serve one another, we are serving God. Jesus said in John chapter 17, Father, help them to become one as you and I are one, that we would be one with them, that they would be one with each other. So there's a connection between us as we serve one another and with God. We're connected. First of all, we're all made in the image of God. And when you're serving a child of God who is made in the image of God, you're serving God. You're serving God. Let me give you an example of that. <clears throat> you could have children. And maybe you need to go somewhere. Something happens, an accident, or whatever, you just need to go somewhere. And someone says, hey, I'll watch your kids. Well, they're serving your kids by watching them, giving them food, taking care of them, you know, making sure they don't get hurt and providing shelter while you're gone. But in a sense, they're also serving you, mm -hmm. right? Because they've allowed you to go and do what you need to do. Yeah. And so somehow, when we serve one another, we're also serving God. So here, we see that these Levites, these tribes, the rest of the tribe, was to serve Aaron, literally serve Aaron. Now, don't misunderstand this. They don't become slaves to Aaron, and Aaron dictates what they you know, need to do. They just had a responsibility to make his life easier so that he could do what God called him to do. You see? And we'll see that as we go through this, as we see the task of all the Levites, what they were in charge of. They were all in charge of certain parts of the temple. Some had to pull all the curtains down. You know, a certain family, we're in charge of the curtains. We're getting ready to move. Get the curtains down. Fold them up. Put them in the boxes. Get ready to go. Boom, we're ready. And the other people over here in charge of all the, maybe, maybe the class that holds the curtains. They're getting them all, putting them in all in boxes. And the other ones are maybe in charge of the wash basin, getting it ready. You know, and they're all doing their part. Once their part's up, boom. You'll see that that's what God called them to do. And you can kind of relate that with the church, right? Mm -hmm. You know, Someone's in charge of making sure the church is vacuumed. And so every week they come in and make sure the church is vacuumed. Make sure the grass is cut. Make sure things are picked up. Make sure the lights are on. You know, make sure this and that. And they're all in charge of it. Why? To free me up so that I don't have to do that. I can focus on the word. So you see the similarities there. Now you know what that tells me? That tells me the Bible is so awesome, isn't it? Amen. It's like one author wrote this. The author that's writing this about the priests and how they should function, all of a sudden thousands and thousands of years, and this is how the church is going to function. Like it's the same guy. Because it's like the same principles that are being applied, and yet in a different way, right? Interesting. I think that's evidence of the Bible. I think it really is. I think we need to consider that. And it just makes our faith in Christ even stronger. Verse 7 says, And they shall attend to his needs and the needs of the whole congregation before the tabernacle of meeting to do the work of the tabernacle. So not only to him, but also the congregation. That means all the other tribes. They make, need to make sure their needs are met. What kind of needs? Well, offerings. You know, inspecting their, their, their lambs as they bring them to offering, collecting of the treasury, the tithes and, and offerings and so forth. That's how they're meeting the congregation needs. Prayer. Counseling, those type of things, but also the work in the, in the temple. So it's not necessarily just Aaron, but the people also. So in a sense, again, let's go back to the church and how it functions and how God, same mindset, brings it to the 21st century, 22nd century, right? And now he says, when you're in church, you serve one another, but you're also serving the congregation, you're serving the congregation. And you're serving the temple. Because there's guys who set up. There's guys who tear down. There's guys who just do cones alone. You know, and every one of those things are important. So again, God has an order and an organization, doesn't he? I mean, again, I, mean, I don't want to belittle that point. As I mentioned it last week, order and organization. I spent quite a few minutes on it, I know. Because I'm, um, you know. Is it ADH, whatever that is, OCD. right? But come on, guys, look at this. Look at the order that God, I mean, he's just a God of order. He's organized. 
You know, I don't know if he's got the biggest MacBook, Excel, worksheet, spreadsheet up there in heaven, but he, man, everything is taken care of. And it's placed in order. And we see that. And the Levites were under the direction of Aaron, that they may serve him, and they are given entirely to him. Not to be misused again, but to use for the glory of God. You know, they weren't to do their own thing. Can I say that? They weren't to do their own thing. They were assigned by Aaron to do the things that they were needed to do. You're in charge of the curtains. I don't want to be. No, I'm sorry. But you're in charge of the curtains. Take care of that. That's all you need to worry about. Also speaks about how thin we spread ourselves too, right? Because sometimes, you know, we're doing not just one thing. We're doing a bunch of things. And we're spread around. And what happens when you're unorganized like that? Nothing gets done. <laughs> Nothing gets done. And that's why we need people to step up to the plate and say, hey, I can do that one thing. You know, if you're not serving in church... Pick one thing you can do and just be faithful to it and see what God will do. But you're not doing things on your own. You're, you just don't go out and do whatever you want. And there was a guy here years ago, and again, reading this, you see this so clearly in scriptures. But we had a work party, and uh, we, were tr we had a list of things and what we needed to do. Just everything was in order and written down. And we were going to knock all these things out, just like we do when we are remodeling a church and have been. And this guy came in, and all of a sudden he's out in the parking lot, and he's, he's chopping a tree down. And I'm like, uh, what are you, can you help us over here? No, no, no. The Spirit's leading me to do this. <laughs> and we always blame the Spirit, you know, because we want to do our own thing. And I go, well, the Spirit has put me in charge. <laughs> And these are the priorities. And he looks at me and says, you're quenching the spirit. And I'm like, okay, <clears throat> do your thing. You can't do anything because the person doesn't want to follow. <clears throat> so they want to do their own thing. <clears throat> Nothing in the holy things of God was left to chance or in improvisation. None of the sacred persons who ministered in his presence was to be unprepared or untaught. They were, be, they were to be ready for this. In some way, being a priest was far more visible and perhaps glamorous than a Levite, you would even say, right? I mean, how, how, how similar is that? Because usually it's the pastor that becomes the, the, the focus point, right, of a church. I mean, we know some pastors in our little community that are huge, and he's the focus point. They're the focus point, right? And then everyone else is doing all the work. I think sometimes that, um, that God's going to bless them more than the focus point. Because pastors oftentimes get their reward right there and then. <clears throat> when someone comes up and says, great message, oh, he just took my reward. Yeah. Or when someone pats them on the back. Or when they're standing at a mic and they're saying, oh, I had this great point and this great message I gave the other day, and that's your reward. The accolades and things like that. But the silent servant... <laughs> The silent servant that serves and nobody knows about it, that's the one who will be rewarded greatly. Think of Acts chapter 6. It says, Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. This was Peter and the apostles. It's not what God wants for us to leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you Seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, wisdom, whom we may anoint or appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continue to prayer and the ministry of the word. And so that's the responsibility of the pastor and leadership is to find people that are faithful. They're not wishy-washy. They'll keep their word when they say they're going to do something. You know, make your yeses yes and your noes no. Otherwise, let someone else do it. It's going to be faithful. Find faithful men, as it says there. Faithful, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with wisdom, that have understanding how the church functions. So important, otherwise the church will be in chaos. Similarities. Back to verse 8 in Numbers, chapter 3. Also they shall attend to 
all the furnishings of the tabernacle of meeting and to the needs of the children of Israel to do the work of the tabernacle. And you shall give the Levites to Aaron and his sons, and they are given entirely to him from among the children of Israel. So you shall appoint Aaron and his sons, and they shall attend to their priesthood. But the outsider who comes near shall be put to death. So if a Levite grew jealous and decided they wanted to do the priest's work, which happens, <laughs> it was strictly forbidden. It was an affront to God's order and organization. And that stranger was not allowed in there. Just not allowed. This happens in church. <clears throat> Calvary Chapel has, has taken the philosophy of just Acts chapter 6, you know, watching people. So are they faithful? Do they keep their word? Um, and letting the Spirit move in their lives and then raising them up. But if a guy just wants to come and teach and doesn't do anything, doesn't serve, doesn't love people, doesn't counsel, doesn't pray with people, and he just wants to teach, that's not the guy you want. I think that's kind of like that forbidden stranger that just wants to do a thing and is doing his own thing, you know? You can't do your own thing. It's not about you doing your own thing. We are an organism working together to accomplish something. And then the Lord spoke to Moses, verse 11. Now behold, I myself have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel instead of every firstborn who opens the womb among the children of Israel. Therefore, the Levites shall be whose? Mine. Now you remember back in Exodus, uh, God chose the firstborn of every tribe to serve in the temple. So now he's changing the rules here. Now it's the firstborn of the Levites will serve in the temple. <clears throat> and so no longer will they choose from the tribes. The firstborn belonged to God. The firstborn lamb was the, the ewe lamb would be given to the Lord. It's always been the firstborn. And God didn't want human sacrifice, so it's not like other nations. So he took the tribe of the Levites as an offering to serve in the temple. Verse 13 says, Because all the firstborns are mine, the Levites are mine. On the first day that I struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified to myself all the firstborn in Israel, both man and beast. They shall be mine. I am the Lord. You and I belong to the Lord. We are the Lord's. He gave His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for you. He redeemed you. We'll see that at the end of this chapter. He literally redeemed. He paid the, the penalty, the cost, to redeem you so that you could belong to Him. He did that sacrifice. If somebody comes to your home in the middle of the night and kidnaps your child, and you don't know where that child is, you just know they've been kidnapped. And then you get a call on the phone and says, we have your child. We have your child and if you pay one million dollars, you know, we will get your child back. And you're going, we got to raise a million dollars. We have to raise a million dollars because your child's not yours right now. And you want your child to be yours. So you raise a million dollars, you pay the million dollars, and now your child is yours. You redeem them from this person that kidnapped them. We were all kidnapped. Satan had our hearts before we knew Christ. We were in his hands doing his will. And then Christ redeems us and puts us into the kingdom of God to do our will? No. To do his will. We're his children. And that's a, that's a concept that we don't get. The church doesn't get anymore. It used to get it, but it just doesn't anymore. See, we belong to his kingdom. He's the king. <laughs> and as king, he makes the rules. He governs the land. And we're to be submissive to his rules and kingdom. You know. But we want our own kingdom, right? We either are in God's kingdom or we're in our kingdom. And in our kingdom, we're the king. And since we're the king, we make the rules. We can't go over there because over there is too hard. Because now you've got God telling you what to do and you don't like people telling you what to do. You know, we, Especially, you know... <coughs> Uh, people who own businesses, uh, they own businesses for a reason. Because they don't like people telling them what to do. <laughs> they want to make the decisions, right? And that makes sense to me. I mean, I, if I could, I could own a business. Uh, if I didn't like 
being told what to do when I worked for Southern California Edison, but I did it anyway. They told me this is how much you needed to produce, so I produced that. This is how you do it, so I did it, and I got a paycheck at the end of the week. I, I got paid pretty good, so I didn't mind it so much. But there's this rebelliousness in us that says, I don't really want to do that, because we want to do our own thing. You know? And God says, you're mine, you belong to me, and belonging to me means that you follow my rules. And here's the neat part. That his rules are not burdensome. His rules are not harmful. His rules are rules that will bless you. They'll bless your socks right out of your feet. Your socks will literally fly off your feet if you just fall under his rules. It's how it works. It really is how it works. I can't believe sometimes how I see people, you know, make decisions outside of God's word and then things go all chaotic and then they go, what happened? I don't know. Well, because you didn't follow God's word. And that's why you've lost everything. That's why things are happening. Get back to his word, and God promises he'll take care of you. He'll meet your needs. There's a scripture in, in 2 Corinthians, I believe it's chapter 5. <clears throat> it says, do not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. What has an idol with God? An unbeliever with a believer. Light with darkness, right? And, and you see these young ladies that are like, God, I just love him, though. Is he a believer? No, not really. Then you need to not be yoked together. But I think that given some time, he'll come to the Lord. No, the Bible never says that. It's don't, don't do it. It's not worth it. So you can fall in love with somebody. Falling in love is easy. It's the commitment that's hard. You stay with someone long enough, you can eventually like their character and fall in love with them. And it's interesting that you can fall in love with several people at the same time. And it happens all the time. Because love is an emotion, it's a feeling. But the commitment to what? To the truth. To the truth is what is important. And so that young lady then decides, well, I'm going to marry him anyway. Well, you know, as a pastor of a church, I won't be the one marrying you. You need to go somewhere else. Well, I will. You, all you know I will. Okay, go ahead. And they do. And then they're back here, you know, they're saying, we have so many problems. You know, I don't know what to do. He's never around anymore. And then they're like, okay, well, I'll help you as much as I can, but, you know, you made the decision. Now you're stuck with that decision. You know, you give them the best advice as you can, and you leave the rest to the Lord. But we're the Lord. We belong to Him. And belonging to Him, there's a security, there's a rest, there's a peace there when we're under his umbrella and his rules. Second point, the senses. We'll go through this rather quickly. Verse 14 through 37. Then the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, saying, Number the children of the Levites by their father's house, by their families. You shall number every male from a month old and above. So Moses numbered them according to the word of the Lord as he was commanded. These were the sons of Levi by the names, by their names, Gershon, Kohath, Miriam, and these are the names of the son of Gershon and their family, Libani and Shami, and the sons of Kohath by their families, Amram, Izhar, Hebron, and Uziel, and the sons of Mary by their families, Malai and Mushai. These are the families of the Levites by their father's house. Now, they were to be categorized by families, with the main groupings according to the Levites' three sons, for a reason, because they all had their specific tasks that they needed to perform. So let's read on. From Gershon came the family of the, the Libnites and the family of the Shemites. These were the families of the Gershonites. Those who were numbered according to the number of all the males from the month old and above of those who were numbered there were 7,500. The families of the Gershites were to camp behind the tabernacle westward. Now, the camp was behind the tabernacle, but they were between the tabernacle and westward. So they were close to the tabernacle. God specifically had them by the tabernacle. They were always to be by the tabernacle. Similarities today. If you're a minister, if you're a leader, 
you should always be close to Jesus. You have to be close to Jesus. You have to be praying all the time, talking to him all the time, reading scripture all the time, being encouraged all the time, hearing the word all the time. You got to stay close to the tabernacle at all times. Now, here in the Old Testament, Numbers, the reason they were close is because when God says, let's move, we're moving. They had to be right there to start tearing down the tabernacle. Remember, it's portable. It's not a permanent tabernacle yet. And so they had their job and their responsibility. And the leaders of the father's house of the Gershonites was Elisaph, the son of Leo. The duties of the children of Gershon in the tabernacle of meeting included the tabernacle, the tent, the covering, its screen for the doors of the tabernacle of meeting. So that was their responsibility. And the screen for the doors of the court, the hangings of the court, which are around the tabernacle uh, and the altar and the cords according to all the work related to them. So you see their responsibility. Now Kohath. From Kohath, verse 27, came the family of the uh, Amorites, the family of the Ezraites, and the family of the Hebronites, Hebronites, and the family of the Izanites. These were the families of the Kohathites. According to the number of all the males from a month old and above, there were 8,600 keeping charge of the sanctuary. That's a lot of people. 8,000 people keeping charge. Some of these churches that, that have 20, 25,000, you probably have about that many keeping charge of your church, maintaining it and so forth. And the leader of the father's, father's house of the families of the Kohanites was Asphalim, the son of Israel. Their duties included the ark, the table, the lampstand, the altars, utensils, the sanctuary with which they ministered, the screens, and all the work related to them. And Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, was to be chief over the leaders of the Levites with oversight of those who keep charge of the sanctuary. So great business plan right here, right? You have managers helping you to run each of the areas. That's how a church should function today. And it functions that, well, that way very well when you put people in charge of the different areas. A lot of times churches will actually have managers that actually help the pastor run the church. And they'll usually hire that person to oversee all the ministries and then they report back to the pastor so then he can make decisions and so forth. Because it's just too big to do. Um, and then that manager has people and leaders in charge of various ministries that report to him. So it just kind of trickles down that way and it keeps the order, right? So it's not chaotic. <coughs> now we see the census and the duties of the family of Mary. And Mary came and the family of the Melites, the family of the Mushites, and were the families of Mary. The families of Mary were about 6,200 males that were camped northward to the tabernacle between Dan and the tabernacle itself. So again, they were in the, close to the tabernacle. And those who were numbered according to the number of all the males from the month old and above were 6,200. The leaders of the father's house of the families of Mary was Zeel, the son of Abahel. These were to camp on the north side of the tabernacle. And the appointed duties of the children of Mary included the boards of the tabernacle, its bars, its pillars, its sockets, its utensils, and all the work relating to them. And the pillars of the court all around, and their sockets, their pegs, and their cords. So that was their responsibility. And now we see the dedication as they begin to uh, close this chapter here. Moreover, those who were, third point, Levi's dedication, those who were to camp before the tabernacle on the east before the tabernacle meeting were Moses, Aaron, and his sons, keeping charge of the sanctuary to meet the needs of the children of Israel, but the outsider who came near was to be put to death. That was their responsibility. Moses and Aaron and his sons were right there at Tabernacle to meet the needs of the people, to offer up the sacrifices, going to the Holy of Holies, the Day of Atonement, as high priest. And if someone came along and wanted to be high priest, you know, can't do it. Put them to death. Now, this is what's interesting. And we know back in Korah's days, right? This had, this had to be said because Korah tried to put himself in the place of Moses, right? You remember that story? How Aaron made a calf and then they all began to worship him and Korah said, I'll be your leader in a sense. 
when Moses came down, and what's going on? And Aaron's kind of like, I don't know, Moses, we just kind of threw the gold in, and poof, there was a calf. You know, <laughs> come on, Aaron. It took some work and deliberate, you know, uh, intentions of, of building this thing, Aaron. And Korah says, Moses, who are you? We're men just like you. We can talk to God just like you can, Moses. And Moses, instead of arguing with him and say, no, God called me, not you. Leave me alone. You're being bullies. He didn't say that. He just said, you know what? Let's come back tomorrow. We're on the same time. Right here. And let's just pray, offer up sacrifice, and let's see who God chooses. Let's leave it in God's hands. Right? And of course, they met together, and Moses, being the generous, meek guy that he was, guys, whoever, come on my side. <laughs> whoever you want to come, come over, because God's going to do something here. And it's going to be great. So either you're on my side or you're not. Now stick with, with uh, Korah if you like to, you know, but I wouldn't. And the earth opened up and swallowed Korah and everybody else in it. God chose. God chose. So that tells you that when God chooses a pastor of a church, you should not be trying to take his place. You should not be trying to do that. You should not be running your own little thing in the background. You shouldn't be trying to take charge of, of things. There's a order that God has established. Now, if you were living in the Old Testament and you tried to take Aaron's spot, you know, because you're telling people, you know, Aaron embezzled money, and you're spreading everything all over the place, which is a lie. And hopefully someone will say, well, Aaron shouldn't be the high priest. Why don't you be the high priest? Oh, thank you. I never thought of that. <laughs> well, yeah, you did. And you're trying to put your way in there. If you were in the Old Testament, what would happen? They'd put you to death. Because that's not your place. When you are trying to work your way in the flesh, you'll never be able to work your way in. It's got to be a call of God. It blows me away that people choose the career of being a minister. It makes no sense. It's not a call of God. That's a fleshly thing. Mm -hmm. you, you decide to you know, become a minister. You know, take the online course. <laughs> and now I can be a pastor of a church. You know? That's not a call of God. You have to put your time in. It's, it's a work and a call that God only does, not a man. Moreover, verse 38, those who were to camp before the tabernacle on the east, before the tabernacle of meeting, were Moses, Aaron, and his sons. That's their responsibility, guys. Their responsibility. They were to be the priests. They were to be the pastors of the churches. Uh, chaplains. Now, I get chaplains. Again, it's a fleshly thing. It's an appointed thing. You don't find chaplains in the Bible. You know, you just don't. So that's something that they decide to do because they're not called to be pastors. The chaplain's a little bit easier. They are taken away from pastors who are supposed to do the, that work, but it does, in a sense, help out, too, because the work's being done at the same time. So I'm not saying that, that it's sin or that it's wrong, but it's not a biblical thing. It's something that someone has decided this is what we're going to do. So, but it's not a biblical thing. And that's okay. But it's not a biblical thing. It's not something that God has said this is, you know, uh, the call of a chaplain. And these are the requirements of a chaplain. No, when you read Timothy and Titus, it's a bishop and a pastor. And these, these are the, the requirements of those that are called to do that. Now, all were numbered of the Levites who Moses and Aaron numbered at the commandment of the Lord, their families, and all the males from a month old and above were 22,000. Then the Lord said to Moses, number all the firstborn males of the children of Israel from a month old and above and take the number of their names. And you shall take the Levites for me. I am the Lord instead of all the firstborn among the children of Israel and their livestock of the Levites instead of all the firstborn among the livestock of the children of Israel. So Moses numbered all the firstborns among the children of Israel as the Lord commanded him and all the firstborn males according to the number of the names from a month old and above of those who were numbered of them were 22,273. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the Levites instead of all the firstborn among the children of Israel and the livestock of the Levites instead of their livestock. So he's, he's doing the switcheroo. Number them. Now, why is he numbering them? There's a reason. And then he's going to do the switcheroo where the Levites then will take over and their uh, firstborn livestock will be given all to the Lord. 
And then it says in verse 46, well, let's go back to 45 where he says, The Levite shall be mine, I am the Lord. And for the redemption of the 273 of the firstborn of the children of Israel, who were more than the number of the Levites, you shall take five shekels for each one individually. You shall take them in the currency of the shekel of the sanctuary, the shekel of the 20 garrets. So here's what was happening. You obviously remember the story in Egypt, the firstborn, they actually died if they didn't have the blood of Christ. Uh, and the different uh, cultures and nations at that time also had a offering of the firstborn, but their offering usually was in fire. Uh, oftentimes they would abort them, kill them, sacrifice them, and so forth. God didn't do that. God says, now you choose the firstborn and you get to redeem that firstborn for five shekels. So you give the five shekels to the priest, you get to keep your son. And it's a, it's a redemption that he did to save their lives, that they may continue to be with that family. So you shall take five shekels for each one individually. You shall take them in the currency of the shekels of the sanctuary. Then he closes, and you shall give the money which, with which the excess number of them is redeemed to Aaron and his sons. They get the money. So Moses took the redemption money from those who were over and above those who redeemed or were redeemed by the Levites. Now you ask yourself a question, and I always ask the question when I see stuff like this because I'm in the midst of ministry. And oftentimes you hear people say that pastor shouldn't be handling the money. And yet God is t telling the people that Aaron's supposed to handle the money. Now, I think there's some <clears throat> wisdom in having safeguards, right? You don't want to just handle the money. You want to make sure that you're handling it correctly and there's no possibility of people accusing you, though they will accuse you no, no matter what, but you can prove that you have not mismanaged the money. <clears throat> I like our system. You know, I don't count the money. We have three, four other people that count the money and they write the numbers down. Everything is on paper. And I, because there's no one yet to do it, at this point our administrator left and so I will take that bag of money that's sealed with signatures and I will run it over to the bank and I will deposit it because we're just not there yet. Now believe me, as this message gets out, they're going to say, you shouldn't be doing that. Well, I know I shouldn't. You want to come over and do it for me? Well, of course not. Well, when the Lord raises up somebody, I will give it up to them to do that. But here we see Aaron handling the money. You know? And so there's a sense that he needs to be responsible with that. And ultimately... Who sees everything? God. He's going to let you get away with it. You know, uh, I lend my my um, car to Debbie today because she's going to be hauling some stuff. And she needed gas. Your so, Camaro? Yeah, my Camaro. <laughs> right. I never do that. It only goes so far, buddy. <laughs> no, my, yeah, my Plymouth Voyager minivan. It's all thrash. And she needed gas. And I said, here, Debbie, here's my credit card. Yes. You know, and I was expecting her to say, Ooh, you trust me with your credit card? I know God's watching you. So God is watching you. You know, so she put gas in there. God is watching us, right? And ultimately we're gonna be responsible to God. We're gonna stand before Him. So we can't hide it. We might hide it from people. We may get away with it from people and not never know. You know, I think of the guy that you know murdered Forrest. He didn't get away with it. We don't know who he is. And he's out having a good time, maybe. I don't know. Maybe he's in jail for another crime that he committed. And when he stands before God, mm -hmm. you know, and he's not going to be able to say, I know I didn't do it. No, God says, no, you did it. We know. We know. And he will be responsible for it. So there's a sense of uh, responsibility there to the Lord. And that's why the beginning of wisdom, <coughs> beginning of, the beginning of wisdom is, is the reverence of the Lord, the fear of the Lord. When you fear him, then you're going to do the right thing. But oftentimes people don't fear the Lord. They just don't. So they just do their thing. Oh, God's not going to do anything to me. I'm going to it. It's sad when people think that. You know, or say something like, no, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so Moses took the redemption money from those who were over and above those who were redeemed by the Levites. From the firstborn... <clears throat> Of the children of Israel, he took the money, 1,365 shekels, according to the shekels of the sanctuary, 
And Moses gave their redemption money to Aaron and his sons according to the word of the Lord as the Lord commanded. Now I know I'll get in trouble because I shouldn't be handling the money. And I agree. I'm not saying that I should. I have to make that clear and double clear. <clears throat> Triple. Triple clear. So, here's the message because it still holds true today, right? Mm-hmm. This is, this is a, a message back in the times of Moses. And it's an orderly message. It's a message that keeps us from being divided against each other, right? Because what causes division? Chaos. When people are, are, are crossing each other's ministries and trying to run them and so forth. I don't, I don't like that. Personally, I don't like that. I don't like to go over and tell someone, okay, you ought to be doing this and this and this. You know, I, let them run it. And if you're under that ministry, you need to let them run it. You're there to help them run it. If they are comfortable with you giving suggestions, which I think is wise, I think that if you're a wise person, you'll receive instruction. I think you'll, if you're a wise person, you'll receive instruction. You'll hear what people have to say, and then you pray about it and decide on what you want to do. That's up to you. You know, Jesse's a young man. He's our worship leader. And I told Carlos, not that Carlos was doing anything, but I said, Carlos, you know, let Jesse lead. He's the leader there. You, know, you support him and help him out. You know, he goes, oh yeah, definitely. It wasn't because he was doing anything, and I have to clarify that. But just as encouragement, because I like to train our people to understand, it will keep the problems down. Now, who's who's going to be responsible when something goes wrong? Jesse. Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> That's the price of being a leader, being a teacher. Greater judgment on you if you're a teacher, right? So this is saying, this truth holds saying then, and it holds true today, and even the redemption part, because Jesus came to redeem us, right? And the Bible says that we need to be redeemed, because we were lost. We were lost without Christ. We were sinners in the midst of our miry, filthy sin. Corrupt, wicked rebelliousness against God himself. And God came down. While we were still sinners, and he died for us because he loved us so much. Amen. That's redemption. And when you realize how wicked you are, and then how God loved you and gave his only begotten son, you'll be born again. Amen. You, you will change. Your life will change. You will view things differently. You will now humble yourself under the hand of God. You'll surrender your whole life to him. But you must be born again in order to enter the kingdom of God. That's the gospel message. You can't get into the kingdom without being born again. At all. You have to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. If you're still doing the same old things, you're probably not born again. You need to go back, get on your knees and pray, God, help me be born again. I pray you send me your spirit so I know that I'm born again. Because people know it. People know it. If someone knows you long enough, they know whether you're the real deal or not the real deal. I mean, Ray, <coughs> Ray Comfort <coughs> shared this story of, of this pastor and his wife uh, getting ready to uh, go to an event and the doorbell rang and the wife opened up the doorbell and said, can I help you? He says, yes, I'd like to see the pastor. I need some counseling. I said, okay, come on in, uh, sit there and he'll be down in a minute. And as soon as the pastor came down, the guy pulls out a knife and begins to try to kill the pastor. And someone made the comment, how can a Christian try to kill a pastor? Well, first of all, he's not a Christian because you're not going to try to kill a pastor. You're not going to try to kill a pastor if you're a Christian. Uh, His Christianity is false because you don't do that. And that holds true with lying, cheating, stealing, all those things. Uh, Chances are you're not a Christian if you're a liar. The Bible says really clear, if you're a liar, you shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's pretty clear. So if you practice lying all the time, don't be surprised. Again, here, here's that warning, because here's wisdom, like the e- unequally yoked. If you think that you need to lie to impress people, you think you need to lie to get out of things, you're not going to get out of it, and you're not impressing anybody, because God knows and you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Look at Judas Iscariot. He was a thief, and he went and hung himself. The devil entered him. He thought he was good. Mm-hmm. You know, he thought he was good. 
So you can't be those things. You must be born again in order to enter the kingdom of God. I hope you're born again. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we do come before you. And Lord, we do pray. Maybe someone's watching this uh, down the road and five years from now. And I just need to tell them, you need to surrender your life. Jesus took your whole debt. He paid the ransom. All you need to do is receive it now and surrender your life to him. And simply by just praying, Lord, come into my heart. Be my God and my Savior. And help me, Lord, through the Holy Spirit to change my old way and become a new creature in Christ Jesus that you've called me to. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 God bless you guys. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we'll see you uh, this next couple of days and, and Saturday and Sunday as we get into an interesting chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. So it's a good chapter. We'll see how that goes. God bless you.